Welcome back to the Collector Chronicles YouTube channel. Today we're going to be looking at collar insignia, U.S. Army collar insignia from World War II, uh, from World War I on through World War II. Um, first we're going to look at, before we do that, we're going to look at the uniforms they went on. So we have here three uniforms. Um, first thing that I should mention is these uniforms don't have any buttons on them. Uh, there's a reason for that. I rescued these from uh, an individual who um, had got them from someone who was going to cut them up and use them for some kind of uh, project. They were going to be destroyed, actually. So the, I got all the uniforms. I got all the buttons and patches that were removed from them. Uh, but that's a whole other video in itself. So um, we have World War One right here. Uh, these are all U.S. Army. That's what this video is going to be about, U.S. Army insignia. So here's a World War One enlisted men, World War I officer grade. And this one is uh, World War II, maybe Korean War, which is, you know, in the 50s. Um, this style right here is what's called an Ike jacket. Um, I think it was named after Ike Eisenhower. Um, he made the, the style popular, I believe. These are four pocket uniform jackets. Uh, the late war U.S. was a two pocket um, and they had uh, four pocket earlier in the war. My uh, my grandpa brought back his uniform and it was a four pocket. He didn't have one of these. So uh, the, the first differentiation to get into um, is the distinction between officer collar insignia and enlisted men. And enlisted men is, you know, what some people call other ranks uh, besides commissioned officers. Um, and it's a pretty easy distinction meaning that the U.S. Um, infantry or U.S. enlisted men had a disc like this right here. And the design and the, the insignia is within a disc that's attached to the collar. And officers had like a cutout version of that insignia. For instance, okay, here's in World War I, you have U.S., and then you have U.S. officer. See, it's like a cutout version um, or three-dimensional. So, so there's a difference between officer and enlisted men. The officers have these cutout special uh, devices, and the uh, enlisted men have the disc. So the next distinction when we're trying to uh, identify collar insignia is World War One on through World War Two. So in World War One. Uh, well, briefly, but one more thing about the uniform. So, World War I, they had the, the high collar like this. That was a style. And then um, after the war in the 20s, they, they started to have these open collar style uniforms. And there was actually a, part, a period in time when they were somehow messing with the collars or altering them to, to convert World War I uh, jackets into like the post-war style. So in World War I, they had insignia and buttons that were like subdued. They were either blackened or enameled or there was like black or brown finish. They weren't shiny. And then in World War, and then in the 20s, they had insignia that was pretty similar, but it was like gold-plated. see if I got one over right here. Yeah, here we go. So, infantry. Yeah, here we go. See there. So there's World War One infantry, and then the 1920s, what they call interwar period infantry, and then in World War Two, they had these were combat uniforms in World War One. World War Two, they had. Um, more combat uniforms that were kind of like a utilitarian type, kind of like modern combat uniforms. And these were more of like a dress or service type of uniform. But they did still have them, and they did still have collar insignia. So here's World War II. Uh, there's different styles. Some of them are like a, um, like a three-piece where you have the U.S. as one part, and then... It goes on the disc, and then there's a screw back, and that way you can take it apart and polish it easier. 
And this style was used into the Korean War and I think into the Vietnam War. So we know the difference between officer and enlisted men. And we know that World War I, they were black. Um, World War II or interwar period, which I don't have one of those. They were um, gold plated, but still kind of like a World War I style. And then World War II, they were multi-piece or these that were stamped and they have have a, a plain background that's another way you can tell the the 1920s ones had like the the, the stippled background so we'll give, go through some examples here so uh, having said that another thing about the enlisted men ones is that you have on the on this side here you have us and then your particular branch of service is going to be on this side. Okay, so here's infantry. So on that side, you'd have infantry. You might have... Uh, here we go. There's the U.S. Corps of Engineers. And this one actually is a, a weird variety. It has like a pin back, like a, like a badge. It's kind of uh, uncommon. It was damaged somehow. So you'd have the other branch there, but that would be U.S. Then they had like um, National Guard type of guys that had like here's um, U.S. National Guard. It's like a monogram all connected. And then they had something called the National Army too, which it was like a whole group that were like drafted. There was like in World War One, they had the AEF, which was the American Expeditionary Forces, and they had this National Army. So it was a huge number of guys that were um, that were in World War One, and a lot of them uh, got into it right as the war kind of ended. So, so for officers though, you had you had two things. You had you had the U.S., and then you also had, like, here's a U.S. infantry officer. He would have this on both sides. This one I dug up, actually, so it's got a little dirt on it. And so, back to the uniforms. The World War One. Get all the way down here. The World War One had, for enlisted men, even without looking at rank, first thing is, Here's the cuff, okay? The cuff is plain. But then for officers in World War I, they had this stripe on the cuff. Another difference between officers and enlisted men in World War I is uh, the officers usually had, like, um, privately purchased, private tailored, higher quality uniforms. Like, this is pretty pretty fuzzy, pretty scratchy uh, uniform. And these, this is like what you call a gabardine wool. It's like a high quality. And... Another thing about this one we'll look at. See, so looks like I'm looking. Ah, right, here we go. See, this one's got a Taylor label. Uh, Ring, Ring and Company Taylor's Little Rock, Arkansas. Another th interesting thing about these jackets is they have this hidden pocket here, and I've collected since I was in my teens, and I've found many things in these pockets where. People, either their hand didn't fit down there. Most of the time, they didn't even know the pockets were here on these if they get them. And um, I think in this one in particular, it's got a nice lining in this one. Down in the pocket. Is this the one? Or is it? Yeah. This one still had a patch in there. I think those might be like years in service overseas or something. I don't think that that's a uh, a rank. I think this went like like further down on the cuff. But yeah, it looks like uh, looks like it was never sewn on. Um, I just I kept this with with the. Uh, but I found a cigar in one of those pockets. I found like movie theater uh, ticket stubs. Um, but the other thing about the officer uniforms is they don't have these pre-made holes. For the for the post to go through these have holes i put one of them on here already and then that disc has a screw back 
and then it goes through there. There's little teeth to kind of hold it from spinning around on the front. Um, I've seen these before where they had like a, a little swatch of cloth to where you didn't have the metal touching your neck. Maybe if it was cold or whatever, it had the, the metal rubbed on your neck. There was like a patch that goes over there. Kind of like there's a patch here that protects your neck from the the hooks because these are these are closed up at the collar. But the world, but the officer ones don't have those holes. See, the collar is kind of malformed, uh, wrinkled, kind of like, but it's it's smooth there. And the reason for that is because you'd have you'd have the U.S. and then where where my rifles go? Well, there's a different variety. And then you have the, like there's a quartermaster core. You'd have both of them on the collar there. And to give you an example of that, where is it? Here's a, here's a photograph from, from Jefferson Barracks from right around the end of World War I. And you have an officer here at his desk at headquarters and you see he's got the U.S. there. He's got the infantry, cross rifles, and then above the cross rifles, there's like a company letter, like company F or P. You see his uh, captain bars on the lapel, on the epaulets. He's got some kind of like marksman medals, marksman, and then like some kind of ribbon bar. See, he's got on his cuff those stripes like that. So maybe he was in World War One, like, or in Europe, like, I mean, we were only over there from 1917, I think, on, so I don't know what those... I think they have something to do with either service or wounding or something like that, so I should have researched that before I made the video, but, yeah, so... And, uh, well, we'll look at pictures. So before World War I, they had these similar uniforms. This guy right here, the guy with the standing... See, his uniform is, like, similar, but the collar, these are cotton uniforms, I believe. The collar goes up and then folds back down. And then usually you'd have, like, a like a um, celluloid collar or whatever, like, the really high white collars. That was, like, the, you know, early 1900s when those really high collars were fashionable. They were still fashionable in World War I, but they had, you know, what this is called, like, a standfall collar. So this is what would have preceded the... The one we're looking at now, the this one here. So I think that wraps up uh, the World War One. Yeah. So so the World War Two, um, it was a similar situation. You'd have sorry, but with that you'd have see these have like a pin back like that. Now what's what's weird is some of them. In World War II, like, my grandpa brought this stuff back. He had, this is all from my grandpa. And his, have a post, his uniform, um, they must have just, like, uh, poked holes in there to be able to use these earlier style collar insignia. And um, this is stuff he brought back from World War I. He actually enlisted uh, before Pearl Harbor, like, in early 1941. And uh, he was up in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. So he brought back this as a souvenir. And this is like a World War I style. See? A lot of times they would take these World War I style after the war, when they, when they had like the, the gold-plated stuff, they would have to polish off that blackening. Um, that did actually happen. I heard from someone who was there when they did that. So in World War II... Your officers would have had the U.S. Let me get a couple of U.S. here. They would have had the U.S., I think. They had, okay, maybe I'm, I think they had it like this. Someone will correct me. I think officers had it like that. Or they had the U.S. and the things separate on the different lapels. Um, and then sometimes they would have on the World War II, the lower lapels, they'd have their um, inst distinctive insignia, which was these, 
enamel badges like that. I think they put them there. They might have put them on there sometimes. But, so, I think that pretty much wraps up the difference between World War I and World War II officer, enlisted men. Um, different, just to kind of go through a few here. So there's infantry, we already covered that. Here's military police. They're probably my favorite style. These are uh, officer. Military police were sometimes maybe not the most popular among the troops if they were getting in trouble. But uh, those are really cool, those like Revolutionary War flintlocks. And then you have, like I said, quartermaster. It's got the key, sword, and then like a wagon wheel with an eagle and stars. You had... There's enlisted quartermaster. World War II. Um, these are pretty sought after right here. These are World War II U.S. Army Air Force officer. So like, you know, guys on a bomber have those a lot of times the propeller is actually silver sterling silver and i think um, there's a medical corps it's got the caduceus that's officer there is a way to tell like which ones are world war ii or post-war well, apparently um the way they were made, like, I've, some sources say that these were, these domed vaulted ones were post-war, but then in this book it says that they were late in the war. So sometimes you run into conflicting, uh, there's World War II Enlisted Air Corps, or Air, um, Air, Army Air Force. It's called the Army Air Corps, I believe, in like World War I. Um, so, let's see. Apparently, there's also a difference um, with, according to some article I read online, that the the World War II, the pin back things here, which I'm sure everybody has seen these before, these, like, clutch backs. Uh, I read an article that said that, see those little nubs? It calls them cleats. Uh, the article claimed that that was, like, a post-war um, variation or invention or whatever. And that the that the wartime ones were smooth, and to check that, I looked at uh, the stuff from my grandpa, and uh, and it is smooth. And he this is world definitely World War II stuff. When he got back from World War II, he went back to the farm, and he did not you know this would have been kind of like a time capsule of the stuff he brought back. So that kind of supports that, but who knows. Um, there's even some that, like here's one of those uh, Air Corps, Air, Air Force, I keep on calling it Air Corps, uh, U.S. Army Air Force officer, and these actually, probably won't be able to see it, these are actually Sterling, Mark Sterling, and it's tarnished, but it's probably pretty, probably Sterling Silver, and then on the back it's marked um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's kind of like a USB. You got to flip it back and forth. Uh, one twentieth, ten carat gold fill, maybe. And then it says uh, Sterling propeller. So, I actually have a pair of these. I'm going to sell a lot of these, so that's why I'm making the video before I sell them. Um, I have my, my grandpa's that he brought back. I have his uniform and everything, so I already have. So, I guess the last thing I'll go into before I sign off here is uh, they had cap, cap insignia, too. That, a lot more simple. Uh, World War One. they had like a smoky bear hat, and it had, at the end of World War I, um this insignia on there and this would have been blackened and I guess they polished it then in the there's a 
another one. World War One, but it would have been you know dark brown or black. Then the transitional period, 1920s, 30s, with that gold, with that kind of like um, checkerboard background. And then you had World War II, where it was like, like a three-piece, similar to the collar insignia. And then officers had like this big old cutout eagle. So I think that wraps it up. Thanks for watching. Um, if anybody wants to collect collar insignia, if you're just getting into collecting military stuff, um, it's, a, it's a great thing to collect because a lot of these are pretty inexpensive. And there's all different um, designs and everything. So you could, like here's artillery, cross cannons, World War II. You know, you, some of these you can get for just a couple dollars a piece. And you could have like a board and have like a, you know, like a partitioned off, labeled with all the different um, branches and officer. And, you know, you make a pretty impressive display uh, for not that much money. And then if you get into collecting some of the more rare ones, you can go to collector shows and trade with people. Um, you know, they're easy to ship if you ever want to buy and sell them on eBay. They don't cost that much to, to ship. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're wanting to collect military stuff, you know, this is a great way to start. And you can have a pretty impressive display that you can have hanging on the wall and a nice conversation piece. Um, you can get some that are all tarnished and polish them up with uh, brass polish and um, you won't be really hurting anything because some of them aren't really that, that rare. So there's all different varieties. Um, here's the ordinance department. Yeah, so and if you're a metal detectorist, you might run into stuff like this if you're detecting anywhere where there was any kind of military encampment. So if that's what you're into, um, reenactors. You know, reenactors probably know a lot of this already, but if not, there's kind of like a, a refresher on some of the fine points of the, you know, the interwar period ones. So, all right, that's about it for now. Uh, it's almost Christmas, so Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and thanks for watching.